So in terms of trying to do this, and again, the, uh, nobody seems to like artificial and the intelligence. I prefer augmented as opposed to assisted, but you, know, you can pick, take your pick. pick. There are a number of challenges to trying to do this in the pathology community. One is the size of our images. So you've seen from the diagnostic imaging side that their, their images are relatively uh, small in, uh, in size compared to pathology. But because we have very complicated uh, components within the specimens themselves, we've got H&E, which makes them red and blue, and immunohistochemistry, which can make them brown or other colors depending on the chromogen. Uh, they're three-dimensional in that there's a Z-stack as you cut through the uh, levels of, uh, of tissue from one section to the next, uh, things will bury in it. And then finally, when it comes to the analysis of these, a lot of these algorithms are, are black boxes, as you heard earlier, uh, and we don't really understand exactly what they're doing in comparison to what it is that we're seeing. So basically the point with, the, with this is uh, to try to uh, sort out these problems because the advantages of doing this kind of work are tremendous. First of all, from the simple standpoint of what it is that we're doing in the clinical trials uh, setting, uh, these are relatively permanent. Uh, in contrast to having glass slides that you have to transport around, and all of you who are CRAs and uh, ask, uh, are hearing from us asking for blocks and slides recognize what a pain this is. At least from the standpoint of imaging, a lot of this can be now done by moving electrons instead of physical assets. They're unbreakable in contrast to glass slides, which we have to be careful about. They're relatively easily shareable because with, a, with an open source, you can go in and look at the images from a variety of different locations uh, and have collaboration occur around them and have, uh, have input into what the analyses are going to be doing. And then finally, we have the ability now with the uh, development of informatics, as you've heard about uh, during the first half of the symposium, uh, the ability to integrate the clinical data into this. So the whole secret to this has been whole slide imaging. You can now take these slides, put them into a machine, and get a digitized uh, image uh, from them uh, that uh, has uh, major advantages to us in terms of, uh, of moving forward. Now, the theory of uh, developing computer systems uh, that will be able to do this kind of work uh, does require uh, human intelligence to a degree. And in particular, it tries to mimic the visual perception that we have uh, but also uh, t relies in, uh, in, in, on the data into decision making. And the reason this is an issue is it's actually a human being, in, unless this is an, a, uh, an unsupervised uh, approach, has to have input and prioritize what it is it's going to be looked at on, on those images and how they're going to be ranked in terms of their importance. The advanced algorithms that can have huge amounts of data in them and can go into an unsupervised mode where there, there is the ability to, to take the uh, data and uh, draw conclusions uh, from it without uh, any uh, bias to it. Uh, and this has been widely uh, pointed out now as being a potential for a computer-assisted diagnosis and prognostication. And the hope is that this is where we're going to get to uh, going forward. One of the problems, again, with this is the technology for this is not widely available in the, uh, in the community. So I have a quick uh, show of hands if you know. How many of your pathology departments are digitizing slides? Show of hands. Yeah, exactly. And so you can see immediately what the problem is when we come to the clinical trial setting. The match trial, for example, had over a thousand sites open, and yet when we start talking about trying to move images instead of uh, instead of glass around this, uh, this was a problem because of the lack of the uh, digital equipment. So, in terms of the use of artificial intelligence or augmented intelligence in in this. Uh, there is the advantage from the standpoint of how we do our work in trials and being able to reduce the turnaround time. Much easier if you've got a scan and put it on the internet, send it, done. Don't have to worry about the overnight shipping and all that sort of thing. Collaborations are much easier because of uh, remote second opinions and, uh, and even beyond that uh, that can be done in, uh, in research groups. The integration of the data sources, once the digitalization is converted, uh, the uh, images into numeric uh, situations that can be compared with other numeric situations in terms of the types of data, uh, allow the integration of those data sources and then subsequent analysis. They have a real ability to improve quality assurance and quality safety in terms of what we're doing, again, because of the collaboration ability and also the fact that the machine learning uh, can contribute and put ideas into the mind of the pathologist with things that we may not have thought of. Uh, this leads to accountability on behalf of the physician uh, because the information is uh, readily available in the electronic health record. And then finally, the, there should be cost savings with this. 
uh, once the uh, processes are improved, again, with eliminating a lot of the problems that are associated with the handling of specimens. Now, from the clinical trials and research side, uh, this has an incredible amount of opportunity available to us. Uh, we should be able to automate and quantify uh, with far greater consistency than we have in the past. And again, the obvious examples are things like Gleason grade, where we know there's a fair amount of intra-observer and even inter-observer variation uh, that occurs among pathologists in this. The computers, once taught how to do this, can do it repeatedly and with a high degree, much higher degree of, of uh, s consistency than we as pathologists can. This should help us greatly in, in uh, biomarker quantitation. One of the reasons that our biomarkers that are done on tissue may not be better than they are is the fact that there is variability in the interpretation of these uh, that occurs, and in particular, again, think back to the HER2 problem uh, in terms of uh, trying to decide uh, what the, uh, the grade of those is, uh, or level of that is going to be. Again, it should it reduce inherent bias. Uh, although we don't intend it, we all have uh, inherent and often unrecognized bias when we look at cases, and sometimes it comes from the fact that uh, we've looked at the clinical history first and then before we look at the slides instead of looking at the slides first before we read the clinical history. And finally, things that we couldn't do in the past are now easy with nuclear morphometry and this kind of thing to get uh, really, literally hundreds of different measures of what the, uh, the factors that we see uh, under the microscope uh, look like. There's the ability, again, in these trials to have deep learning algorithms that uh, will mimic visual perception uh, through the interconnected uh, computational units. Uh, we can look at topography and spatial relationships in a much more uh, uh, fortified fashion than was the case in the past where a lot of this was uh, done uh, by, uh, by estimation uh, rather than uh, numerical uh, assessment. Uh, there are prognostic and predictive subclassifications that begin to emerge from these. Uh, and in particular, we can also pay attention to the microenvironment uh, separate from the malignant uh, cells that are, that are in the tumors as a way of uh, providing additional information for association with the outcomes in clinical trials. So is this happening? Well, the answer is yes. Uh, the good news is that this has started to move into the pathology community, at least in the research mode. And here's a, a study that recently appeared in, uh, in Cell. Uh, this one looking at uh, breast cancer cases. And as you can see on, on this, uh, there's a comparison here of the pathomorphology and over here the histology uh, in invasive ductal, invasive lobular mixed uh, carcinomas, and clearly there are differences uh, among them. So again, with the ability to, uh, to use these types of approaches, we'll begin to understand uh, subcategories of tumors better than we have in the past. This particular one was looking at stemness based on alterations in pathways that are known to be oncogenic drivers. From the standpoint of looking at markers, some of these have now started to appear. This was a, a paper that came out very recently in, in Science Reports, uh, and this group was looking at patients in a clinical trial with epilumumab uh, with uh, machine-based uh, quantitation of the number of uh, lymphocytes in it and produced a very nice separation of the curves that uh, begins to uh, get you to think about applying this prospectively in terms of patients whose tumors were going to be sensitive as opposed to resistant uh, in terms of uh, the uh, infiltration of, uh, of lymphocytes. So in summary, digital pathology with whole slide imaging has opened up opportunities we just didn't have in the past. It now allows us to do things that we simply could not do by visualization alone without quantitation. It should improve the efficiency of tissue-based annotation of specimens and reduce the cost of clinical trials. Uh, it should increase the reproducibility of biomarkers when we identify candidates and uh, have to evaluate them, particularly for regulatory agencies. And finally, it creates archives for integrative studies uh, that will be uh, helpful to us in the, uh, in the future. This approach in, uh, in clinical trials, again, can be used for digital images to do these kinds of phenotype, genotype correlations that, again, were largely impossible uh, in the past. It'll help us to explain the mechanisms of sensitivity and resistance to therapeutic agents in trials. And in addition to what uh, Dr. Getz just talked about at the molecular level, uh, the expectation is that the morphology is going to have uh, impact on that uh, as well. As he mentioned, the development of neuroendocrine differentiation uh, within tumors and, and the change of, uh, of uh, phenotype well recognized as being a resistance mechanism at the molecular level. And finally, it should allow us to develop uh, better predictive biomarkers by having uh, better tools at our disposal. Thank you very much.